Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Q&A for Sound Healing Immersion, the seven-week video course to clear blocks in your energy body, transform disease, and raise your consciousness. My name is Nadira Ade, and it is my pleasure to be your host as we explore the teachings of David Gibson and address questions about his upcoming course, Sound Healing Immersion, which is beginning Wednesday, December 4th at 12 noon Pacific. If you are unable to join us live, you can still participate in this course. I'll explain more about that later. But first, I want to introduce our very special guest. David Gibson is a leading scholar and researcher in the field of sound healing and therapy. He developed a complete perspective of how sound affects us physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and distilled it into the hierarchy of vibrations found in the universe. David is the author of the number one selling book in the field of sound healing, The Complete Guide to Sound Healing. He's the creator of the Sound Healing Research Foundation to bring sound healing into the mainstream, spearheading research projects involving sound and music, excuse me, for ADD, ADHD, PTSD, anxiety, anger, and grief, autism, pain management, sleep, schizophrenia, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, addiction, brain injuries, Parkinson's, and dementia. David runs the Sound Therapy Center at the Globe Institute, offering over 15 types of sound healing treatments. And now, join me in welcoming David, who is going to lead us in an opening practice. David, welcome to the call. Hi there. Hello, Pleasure hello. to be here. Hi, hi. So, yeah, um, I wanted to start um, with, uh, actually, I wanted to tell you the, the main thing we're going to be doing with the course is, you know, most people, all they really care about is taking care of their problems or getting high <laughs> or getting still, which is really the best part. Because when you get still, often your problems go away. So those are the main things we're going to be doing. But right now, I want to help get you high with sound. <clears throat> so let's do this. Drop down into your heart now. Bring love into your heart completely. And then feel this love through your whole body. Universal love. Maybe you need to go back to a time when you felt love. Just bring it into your heart now. Then if it had a sound, get it going in your head. Just play with it, high or low. You can't get it wrong. Just play with it. Listen for a sound that matches this feeling of love. Then make it out loud. Just make any sound out loud of love. Now, Send it to everybody listening to this show. Don't forget to receive it. Now, send it to everybody on the planet and listen for their hearts responding. Now, send it to source and listen for the universal love coming back. Whee! 
Now, send it to your own heart. Thank you. It's all about stable, consistent vibrations as opposed to chaotic. It's the whole deal. Thanks. Thank you so much. We're going to spend the rest of our time together exploring your questions for David as we prepare for his video course, Sound Healing Immersion, which begins Wednesday, December 4th. Please visit our website, soundhealingimmersion.com, to learn more about this seven-week course and to find a link, a link to register. And now let's get started. If you have a question for David, please type it in, and I am happy to bring it forward. We're going to start with a question that was submitted via the webcast. And it is from Gail, who says, do Tibetan singing bowls continue to vibrate at adequate frequency levels in order to invoke transformation of cell patterns, also of the subconscious, as opposed to the higher frequency levels emitted by crystal singing bowls? Thank you. <laughs> well, that's a loaded question. But, you know, really, the, the absolutely. The, the main difference, of course, there's diff quite a few differences. The Tibetan bowls are made of metal. It's a different energy than the quartz crystals. But the cool thing about the Tibetan bowls is they are the main ones, the, the real ones from Tibet are actually hammered into their frequency with prayer. So they've got that intention embedded in them, right? Um, they're, the best thing about Tibetan bowls especially, are the big ones, where you can put them right on the body. Physically, I've got one right here, where you can, this even isn't even that big, but you can put it right on the body and hit them, and it's almost as good as a sound table. It's serious physical vibration. You can actually do that with the quartz bowls as well, but... Um, they don't vibrate nearly as much. Um, the quartz uh, crystal bowls have the energy of quartz, which a lot of it has the electromagnetics to it. And some people say it's more alive energy than metal. But, you know, uh, with the right intention, just about any instrument can really do the job. Tibetan bowls are really nice, though. I really like them a lot. And they can totally access other dimensions when you're working with them. Or, uh, because that prayer is in, embedded, there's a lot going on. Not to mention, uh, there's different ways you can use them. I mean, you can hit them, you can ring them, you, you know, there's all different ways. And then you can get into the frequencies. There's a lot of possibilities. Hopefully that answers that question. Yes, thank you so much. Brenda would like to know, is humming part of sound healing? Can one just hum any tune and would it bring about healing? And if so, how does that work? Would you please expand on this? Yeah, you know, humming falls into the realm of the vowels. Whenever you do any vowel, you're making a consistent, stable vibration as opposed to the chaos of, ah, <laughs> right? All the vowels, I mean, if you look at it from an emotional perspective, it's like the chaos is like fear, ah, or anxiety, ee, or, or um, pain, ee, or stress, right? Whereas all the vowels are stable, consistent vibrations which create peace like this. Humming is kind of like the secret vowel. It's really like an M. And also there's the other secret vowels that are the S's and the uh, the H's as well, because those are the other consonants that you can elongate. So any vowel or any sound that you can do elongated 
creates that stability of vibration over time, and that's the definition of peace. Peace is a frequency humming consistently. So yeah, humming is wonderful. It sometimes tickles my lips, so I like to do vowels, uh, but it's all perfect. It's all perfect. So absolutely. Even humming to music, any sound you make with the voice is wonderful. Thank you. Veronica says, as an amateur musician, I'm fascinated by your work. As a sometimes insomniac, I'm wondering how this can help me sleep and stay asleep. There's a couple of different ways. One is just to listen to music, of course, and I do have my sleep CD that's really effective. There's also the Unconditional Love. There's a lot of other music out there that you you know, can find on YouTube or that you might have come across. And, and so that's an obvious one. The best thing, though, is to get binaural beats that are tuned to you in Delta. Delta is a rhythm between 0.5 and 4 cycles per second, which is about wow wah, wah, to wah, 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 wah. And everybody's rhythm in Delta when they're in deep sleep is a little bit different, right? So if you find, uh, when you find your natural rhythm for Delta and you get a Delta CD or a CD with Delta binaural beats embedded in it, which is simply that rhythm, then it will entrain your brain into your natural sleep state. And there's some good research that shows this is way more effective than just what you could find on YouTube. So the first step of that is to find your actual rhythm, which we'll talk about in the classes. We also do an assessment here at the school where we, we do it over Skype, where we play each of the 12 notes and we can find which note is the most peaceful for you. If you're a musician, you might already know. You might already know what key really feels the best for you, right? And sometimes you can play with different bowls and sometimes play on a keyboard and find that note as well. And then we can, uh, and then just to play in that key is helpful, but then to get binaural beats in that is even better. But it's also, you know, sleep is a little more detailed because it's not just right when you need to go to sleep, you need to do something. It's really a lot about what you do through the day. The more times you go to peace and stillness through the day, the more likely you'll be able to sleep later at night because you're already overcoming that anxiety that sometimes builds up in the day. So this could mean playing crystal balls, Tibetan balls, you know, working with tuning forks, toning, chant, mantra, just, just, or just an ohm, right? So there's, there's a lot more in a full practice that can really help. I have a lot more ideas that we can go to into more detail in, in the classes as well. Thank you so much. Elle would like to know, do you have any suggestions for ways that I can make sound healing teen friendly? I'd love for them to use sound healing to help with their anxieties, ailments, and frustrations. I have brain entrainment frequencies playing at home, but they keep their headphones on and don't like to listen to the sound frequencies. They do, however, enjoy live sound baths with crystal bowls. Can recorded sound baths be as effective as a live experience? Well, first of all, you know, we got a $100,000 grant to take our entire curriculum here at the Institute with our 20 instructors into two Montessori schools. And we created exercises for three-month-olds all the way up to 18-year-olds. So we have a detailed curriculum, over 2,500 exercises we've created. So I've got a lot of ideas. And if you ever want to contact me personally, we can talk about them in more detail. But as far as actually ideas, um, you know, I mean, you know, getting them, it's interesting because sound, uh, first of all, let me say, uh, respond to the, the thing of listening to sound baths. 
it's it's effective, but you know it's not nearly effective as effective as when you actually are there. It's uh, um, I, you know, teens generally want more activation. So I've got a song called um, "Power of Love" that we played for some teens and that even have disabilities, and they're very focused on it. And that's very cool. You know, another way is to get them into binaural beats that are more their style of music. If you look on on YouTube, you can find many CDs, uh, uh, many songs that are very cool that could be appropriate because you're not going to be able to get them to listen to something that they don't like. Right. So so the trick is to find things they like that actually do that have maybe have, have binaural beats in them that can also bring them to stillness. Um, boy, the other main thing, uh, let's see, the cool thing is to start having them make the sound of how they feel, right? To, and whenever you're communicating with them and they got anything emotional going on, say, how does, you know, how, make that sound. And they may be scared to make the sound at first, but to get them where they're comfortable making any sound, just like babe, they were when they were babies, right? That's probably really important so that they can express themselves emotionally better. Um, trying to think of other things that would get them really interested. I think those are the main ones I can think of. There's so many exercises that we've come up with doing different vowels, uh, doing body percussion. That's a really good one is to do, teach them how to do body percussion, right? There's a lot of body percussion because that gets them involved with different rhythms as well. Um, anything they can get in their body is, is really cool. I think there's way more ideas. I just can't think of any really important ones right now <laughs> on this one. Those are excellent. As somebody who was a former stepper and a cheerleader in my performing days, I have an extra vote for the body percussion. I really love those. <laughs> um, so <laughs> Sebastien says, my mind chatter is my biggest problem. It is sabotaging my efforts to live in the present moment. Can sound healing help? I also have issues with tinnitus and find that it gets worse when I use these sounds. Thanks. Um, for chat, mind chatter, there's two ways to go. One is to any, any of the sound healing instruments. You know, let me put it this way. Mind chatter is kind of like this. Sometimes it goes up and gets stuck, right? So it's like got a lot of variations, but it's not a consistent, stable vibration. Any of the instruments, bowls, tuning forks, Right, we got okay. We got crystal bowl. Right, we got tuning forks. All of these are stable, consistent vibrations. But the number one thing that's the most helpful and easiest and cheapest is the voice, and that is to just do the vowels, do om, do humming, do any of those. Now, there's two ways you can go. One is you focus on the notes. There's some exercises that will be really helpful. On um, the fourth class, th that class, I mean, really everything we're going over is going to be helpful for this. But the fourth class is especially helpful when, I'm sorry, the fifth class, using sound to deal with challenges and conflicts. We're going to be going over 11 ways to use sound to create stability. So, uh, so you could, that's the first, is to use instruments or voice to really do stable vibration. The other way is to meet it. Tune into that chatter, and instead of trying to redirect it, uh, I mean, just stop it completely, tune into it and listen to it, and really start singing along with it, right? So it's like your chatter is like, na 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 and start singing along with it. And then when you sing with it, if it gets too chaotic, start shifting that singing to a more stable sound, a more of a vowel, 
Right? For the tinnitus, there's different types of tinnitus. Number one type of tinnitus is that the, uh, the hair follicles in the cochlea in the inner ear are actually creating little spasms. It can also be in the middle ear. It can even be in your brain. So there's different ways to deal with it. If it's a problem, in some people, it's not even a problem. Um, I have tinnitus, and it doesn't bother me at all, actually. But there's the number, the number one thing that I recommend is the program Audio Notch, audionotch.com. And they actually have you find the frequency of tinnitus, and then they give you a treatment, they design a treatment for about $30 or $40, and it goes up and down above and below the tinnitus frequency to break it up. I've heard it's, it's pretty effective. It's not 100% effective, but it's not very expensive, and it's worth a try. I've also had many people say that over even just listening to overtone singing can get rid of it. Another thing that's really cool is to actually find the frequency of it. And they've got a free tone generator on audionutch.com. You don't even have to log in and find the frequency of it and find what note it is and actually start singing to it. So make it your friend so it's not a bummer. Now, there's other people that also say that certain tinnitus in the right ear, I think, are messages from higher beings. I know this one woman that's in the field, and she actually uses her tinnitus to connect to higher energies, to to oneness in the whole universe. So start thinking of it as not a problem. Make it your friend and start playing with it. Sing along with it whenever it's a problem and see what happens. And try all different types of vowels and all different frequencies above, above, and below it and around it. And do an exploration and see what things keep track of what things make it worse and what things make it better. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, Linda says, I am wondering if someone who is deaf in one ear can reap the benefits of binaural healing sounds. Thank you. You can. Um, there's really two benefits that a lot of people don't know about from binaural beats. One is the rhythm. That entrains your brain into that brainwave state. A lot of the CDs say you need to wear headphones, but you don't need to wear headphones to get that brainwave entrainment from the rhythm for delta, theta, alpha, or beta. So you really don't need need need. You could actually just play it in a stereo so that you're getting both frequencies into that one ear, right? If you wear headphones, you will only get one of the two frequencies. Or you could just use a rhythm. You know, you could even tap a rhythm. You could listen to music in different different rhythms, and that will do the entrainment. You do not have to have, have headphones. The only reason you need headphones is for the second benefit of left and right brain entra- uh, synchronization where you've got you know, a different frequency in each year. So you won't get that benefit, but there's many other ways to get left and right brain synchronization. So um, there's, um, I'm trying to think of the other type of binaural beats. Um, can't think of the name of it right now, but there's another one uh, that uh, you can um, 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 uh, use that actually has both of those frequencies in the middle. So they both go to one ear. Can't think of the name of it, though. I'll, I'll remember it later. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, you can absolutely reap the benefits. Because, you know, with shamanic drumming, they're just playing the drum sound bum, bum, right in front of you. Any rhythm will entrain your brain normally within 15 seconds. So you really don't need the headphones or the brainwave entrainment part of it. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. And 
Tatiana says, is it possible with certain vibrations to heal the body from cancer? Oh, absolutely. There's a few ways. Oh, my God, this is a big question. There's a few ways you can go with cancer. Again, cancer is a chaotic vibration, right? Often, I believe, based around fear. Anita Morjani said number one thing that she felt that caused the cancer was fear of what other people think about her, right? So you can, there's really, the, the, there's, I think of it two ways to go is one is to get your play, get yourself to that stable, consistent vibrations, which the whole course we're going to be doing here is about, right? Many techniques, how to do it physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And then you, you get, you know, you get your whole system in coherence, and then the cancer often falls away. But here's another thing I believe about cancer. I believe from uh, working with this guy who was able to get rid of cancer for a long time, he would use really powerful sounds like this. Warning, I'm going to get really loud. Warning, okay, check this out. Whoa! Okay. And I realized what he was doing was he was bringing that empowerment into the person with cancer, right? So what I do is I'll have people work with really powerful sounds and bring those powerful sounds through the boy, voice, like whoa or no. That's a really good one is to use no, no, right? and bring those from the solar plexus so you're in your power. I think that's really important to overcome the fear, which is, I think, the biggest part of cancer. Now, there's many other techniques. I mean, going to your home note so you're totally at peace, because when you're at peace, your immune system works way better, right? But in the future, which we don't have now, but it's coming very soon, is to actually find the resonant frequency of the cancer, turn the volume up and explode it. This is what Anthony Holland is doing. He, he talks about it in his TED Talk. If you do a search for, for uh, cancer and TED Talk and sound, you'll find it, Anthony Holland. And it's very cool. He shows four different types of cancer being, being exploded with four different frequencies. Um, it's also, uh, there's a company, if you search on YouTube for uh, operating room of the future, they're using ultrasound to explode tumors in anywhere in the body. And the, and the people are going home. I don't know if it's on the market yet, but this is totally coming. Uh, but there's also one of our instructors had breast cancer. And she focused on the tumor, went up and down and found the frequency of the tumor. And when she got right on it, it actually heated up. And she went up and down above and below that frequency, right? So just doing a frequency sweep, which we're going to go over in the class in detail, up and down, above and below it. And, and she went in for a surgery like two weeks later, and they said, the x-ray machine is broken. You got to go back in. She went back in and they came out and they said, it's completely gone. The cancer is completely gone, right? So those are a few ways. I've, got, I've been working with a lot of people with cancer. There's many other ways that are very, very cool. Another really good one is to simply send love to your own heart. Right? Or send love to the cancer. Right? Get over the fear. It's all perfect. Mm. Okay. Thank you. That was such a beautiful response. That was powerful. Um, this next question actually kind of connects to that, and you started to touch on it. This person wants to know, how can I know which vibration frequencies are optimal for my body? 
particularly any ill parts. And since you already spoke to um, kind of recognizing the ill parts, can you say a little bit more about the difference between focusing on maybe an illness versus focusing on the entire body and finding the frequency that works for your entire body? Well, that's a big one. Um, you know, one way to simplify it is what, I, what, we, what we start with in the course is some sounds and vibrations are more activating, like gongs, even Tibetan bowls are more activating, right? Especially when played with a wood stick, right? Um, other sounds are more calming, especially the harp and the wood log drums, the tongue drums, right? And, so, and then different vowels are more calming, like oo, oo, versus ah, right? So whenever anybody asks about any issue or disease or any problems in the body, I'm always thinking, does that part of the body need more activation, like I was talking about before with exploding the cancer cells? or more calming, which would be like going to the sound of love for your own heart, right? Like depression, you totally need activation. You might start calm, but you're gonna build into activation. For anxiety, you don't need any activation at all. It's all about calming. So that's one way to think about it. You know, from the most general perspective, again, it's all about getting to a stable, consistent vibration with the instruments or with the voice, right? That's the basis of all sound healing. And that almost always works, right? That's why so many people, regardless of the frequencies they're playing in a sound bath, regardless of the instruments, regardless even sometimes, of the energy of the person doing the sound bath, the big one, right? Then it still works. People go, well, okay, I'm mellowed out, right? Because they're stable, consistent vibrations, right? But from there, it gets really detailed. I mean, we hand out 10,000 frequencies in this class. I, I just, I have a whole list that I've collected over the years, and there's many frequencies for everything you could imagine, physically, emotionally, even for brainwave entrainment, right? Even for, for things like gratitude and, and emotions, or higher emotions, right? And even, even spiritual aspect. And, but the problem is no one agrees with anybody. Doesn't mean that these frequencies aren't cool, right? I mean, I'm not a baby tosser, in fact, I, when I had some issues with my kidneys, I tried all the frequencies that I had for kidneys. There's like eight different ones. Um, I'll try them all. See, and it was cool, you know, because you never know. They, uh, they totally could be very cool, and we don't even, even though there's no good research and we don't even know why. So they're worth trying, right? It's not like they're going to hurt you. But the best thing, and this is what we teach in the course, is maybe those frequencies are different from person to person. So when you can intuitively go to your kidney and go, okay, here's the frequency of my kidney, and I'll do it. And you practice that until you can find the frequency that's right for any part of the body. This is major because this is where we're all headed. We're all headed into a place where we can hear the frequency of anything, like the, the shaman who can hear the frequency of the plant and sing its song and you get its medicine, right? So it's a matter of becoming more intuitive. And the number one thing that will stop you from doing that is your belief you can't do it, right? So it's just a matter of practicing and you get good very quickly. So, and even if you don't get the frequency right, like for the kidneys, you're still sending a consistent, stable vibration. You're not going, you suck, right? Or, ah, right? You're going, if you get it right, 
you're entraining it into its natural healthy state. And that's the new medicine, right? So this is really the deal to get to practice finding it on yourself. Play with the frequencies out there. I'll give you all of those or, you know, uh, uh, or just go into the light. Call in source. Call in higher beings and just let them take care of it. I mean, that's the ultimate, uh, right? Call in source. Call in universal love. Learn compassion. Or just do gratitude. All of those are really easy and you don't have to get specific at all. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation to play and explore. It feels like it opens up so many possibilities. I'm really appreciating that listening to you. So, we have <clears throat> excuse me. One really uh-huh. strict rule here. You can Which never is? ever you can never ever make a wrong or bad sound. You can't be out of pitch and it's always perfect. It's a very strict. Oh, perfect. Word. Because I know there was somebody who was asking about if you are tone deaf. And so there's their answer right there. Perfect. It's, there's, not, there's no such thing. So, as I mentioned, you know, we, as babies, we were professional sound healers. If we had a problem, we would make it out loud. Ah! Right. And then around one or two, it's like, shh. And then you get into school and it's like, no more sound. This is all about reaccessing that God-given gift. It is wrong for anybody to ever say that you're a bad singer or you can't sing. If you've ever have if you ever have somebody say that you're a bad singer or you can't sing, go kick them in the shin. <laughs> it's wrong. It's evil. It's evil. You know, in other countries, in African countries, everybody sings. There's no there's no question of whether you sing good or not or bad. You just sing. It's just crazy in our society that we're so judgmental. You know, just make open your mouth and make noise. It's really the number one healthy thing you can do for yourself is to be able to express yourself with your voice like we had down in the beginning. (laughs) Yes. I receive it. If you're just joining us, we are here with David Gibson learning about his upcoming course, Sound Healing Immersion, which begins on Wednesday, December 4th. Please log on to soundhealingimmersion.com for all of the details and to register. So this next question that I want to offer you is one that um, I was very intrigued by when I first saw it. It's from Linda, who says, most sound healing programs Programs don't speak about the potential experience of pain or discomfort, among other odd or extreme physical sensations that one may feel with sound frequencies. I wonder if you could please address this and explain what is actually creating this feeling, plus how to reassure one that these frequencies have not in fact shifted into a potentially negative state rather than releasing it. Also, perhaps comment on how long one might anticipate a sensation of discomfort to last. These are the things that I find are of greatest concern for my clients. Thank you very much. There's um, two different things here, two different situations. When you're playing instruments, like in a sound bath or using instruments or even voice in a treatment on someone. Um, these, I mean, the instruments can be pretty intense. Odd harmonic or activating sounds like gongs, even Tibetan bowls, especially with a wooden stick, even crystal bowls, the pure tone is often too much for people with uh, um, uh, that are, are very sensitive. Um, these can absolutely be too much for people that are really um, uh, sensitive, but also have panic attacks, have prone, are prone to panic attacks, have fibromyalgia, have uh, you know chronic fatigue, or just, again, people that are really fragile 
or really sense, especially people that are in the hospital or have just gotten out of the hospital, anybody really fragile. You really have to be careful. So it's really important to gauge where that person is at and whether they can handle it and pay close attention and let them know that uh, that if there's something that's really bothering them to let you know that's in a treatment or but in sound baths you know it's good to say that up front that people can leave cuz some people i mean if if you know a gong is dangerous for somebody that's had panic attacks or been having them it can be really dangerous so these are are really uh really important i've even had a couple of people over the years, not many, but just two actually, over the years that had reaction from even tuning forks on them. So, you know, it's really a matter of watching. Now, people have reactions for different reasons, mostly because they're fragile, but sometimes there might be a frequency that's releasing something. So, you know, I've had people like, oh, I can't stand the sound of, of crystal bowls. I'm like, well, come over and play with it, make it your friend. Maybe it's exactly what you need. Oh, no. You know, I mean, it's one woman. She was not going to do it. And other, and other people, you know, they can they can can actually get over that. And maybe it's even from a past life. I mean, who knows, really, right? What the different problems can be. Now, the second situation is in the classroom of what we're going to be doing. You know, I've been doing this over 20 years now. Uh, these classes, we, we're a state-approved college. We have a certificate and associate degree in sound healing at Globe Institute here. It's soundhealingcenter.com, right? And we've, I mean, I've never had anybody in the classes, uh, I mean, people might get annoyed by, uh, by certain sounds or, you know, when I'm doing having people uh, screaming or doing the sound of no. But, you know, it's easy when you're online just to turn the volume down. So it's really important to honor where anybody is at and, and then address them and say, are you ready to try to work through this, to make that sound your friend, to really focus on it and address it like a fear? And often they may not. In fact, I think more often than not, they, uh, uh, they're, they're not going to be ready to actually do that because they may be too fragile. It's not the time. If they're fragile, you don't want to be doing it, right? So you can take that opportunity to work through those sounds. And so, that again, that class, class five where we're using sound to deal with challenges and conflict, one of the biggest challenges we actually focus on in that class is dealing with annoying sounds. And the number one thing is to make it your friend and sing along with it. If you've got something annoying you, sing along with it and start laughing, right? It's way better than going, no, 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 because you're suffering until you can't get away from it. But when you make it your friend and sing along with it, that's very cool. So there's some really cool techniques you can use to help turn this around as opposed to uh, um, yeah, um, having it be a problem. But a lot of people in this field do not talk about the fact that you can hurt people. People that are fragile can be hurt, and you really have to be careful. It's critical, I believe. And the reason I've not had any, hardly any problems at all over the last 20 years is because when you say, this is for the highest good of the person and myself, and you bring that intention that it's for the highest good, then often I really believe that helps. Maybe it won't for somebody that's like really fragile, but that's, you know, I think it's really worth it, uh, important to bring that energy in. Right? It's a very important question. And you know what's so important about this is we are not going to get sound healing into the mainstream, into hospitals, until we address exactly this. The number one thing that the hospitals that we're working with are asking is, what are the safety guidelines for each instrument, for each issue, right? And that's why I created the, the uh, Medical Sound Association to, uh, to be able to come up with guidelines for every issue. Uh, you know, I mean, if someone's got a broken bone, of course, you're not going to put a tuning fork or vibration right on it for at least a week or two. 
right? You can put it around it. But, you know, if someone's just out of the hospital, you got to be really careful with this until we have these guidelines. So we're, we've got many doctors that have joined us and we're going to be coming up with these guidelines in detail over the next you know, five years. And so I think that's critical because when people get hurt, this can cause a problem in the field. So I think it's really important to point out the importance of safety. Thank you very much. And I appreciate you uh, emphasizing the, the awareness of fragility. I'm bringing forward this next question from Alice as a result, who says, my husband has dementia and gets headaches and bangs on the bed. What sounds can I make to calm him down? It depends on the level of dementia. You know, we've had our students for the last 10 years creating treatment plans for all the different issues we mentioned in the beginning. So we've got a really detailed treatment plans for dementia now. And we're working with a center up in, in Napa and, uh, and uh, going to be refining the treatment. There's two different levels. First is the first stages of dementia where uh, you need more activation to activate the brain, to get blood flowing. So drumming, you know, movement, anything that that will, will create, um, I mean, any sound that gets them involved and totally activated and present, right? But then, I mean, uh, the second level is where they, they get to the stage where they're really easily um, um, annoyed or, or get really upset or, or, or uh, have, you know, big reactions uh, and are actually annoyed by sound. And so then it's all about calming sound. Number one thing to do is um, you could just try and do toning when he's doing that. But this is the thing I would do is I would actually look at the rhythm of his beating the bed and start join in with that rhythm. Either do clapping or, or tapping on your leg or do a sound like ba, 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 ba. Then start slowing it down. Ba, 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 ba. So connect with them where he's at and, and train them. Slow him, slow him down until you get to a vowel. So it's like you, can, you could just slow down the rhythm. Ba, ba. Bum, 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 bum. Connect with them. Bah. And then go. Number one thing is to get a connection going, which when you match their rhythm, it's very cool. This is what we do with even the babies and with dementia is really good is anytime they're not connected, they're acting out on that's not the right word. I'm sorry. Anytime they're 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 doing something where they're not connected to themselves. Try and match their rhythm, make a sound to match where they're at until they look at you. This is exact same with autism. You want to do sounds and rhythms to match where they're at so you make a connection, right? And then you can slowly lead that sound into more slow tempo or sustain notes where the piece is. Lead them back to stillness. Right. The connection is the most important of all. Look in the eye. So match where they're at. And, you know, you could even start playing with the rhythm. Just start doing like. Right. So you start like playing with. It. So, you, so you see, you know, I mean, don't make fun of them, but, you know, just just start start. Join in. <laughs> Join in. It's not so bad. It's a cool rhythm. Make it your friend. 
and help them to do it as well. This is serious stuff, really serious stuff, right? You can talk more about this in the classes because this is, uh, I'll go into many tick techniques for all different types of issues. Thank you very much. We're going to have time for one or two more questions, but before we take those, I want to give a few additional details about sound healing immersion. This is going to be a powerful and transformative seven weeks with David that will also incorporate play and connection, where you will uncover your home note to initiate the frequencies you need most. The seven week video course takes place on Wednesdays at 12 noon Pacific, starting December fourth. Please note that we skip the weeks of Christmas and New Year's holidays. If for any reason you are unable to join us live, you won't miss the teachings. You will receive audio and video replays, transcripts, and any handouts through your course homepage. Also, I would like to remind you that we offer a no-risk money-back guarantee on our courses, giving a full two weeks until December 18th in this case to make sure you absolutely love it. As an added option, all participants are welcome to connect to a private Facebook community group to stay connected with one another. And everyone who registers receives the Sound Healing Immersion bonus collection, which includes how sound and vibration work at all levels of reality, which is an audio dialogue from David, the complete guide to sound healing ebook from David, sound healing reader, the collection of digital resources, also from David. And when you register by midnight Pacific on November 21st, you will receive this special bonus as well, which is Unconditional Love, a downloadable audio album, which was created while holding the intention of unconditional love during the recording, mixing, and mastering. It also has the archetypal healing field of universal love embedded in it. It incorporates binaural beats in Delta and deep delta for the deepest relaxation and for sleep. It is meditative, relaxing, and instills a deep sense of peace inside. This song has been extremely successful in getting rid of anxiety attacks, and it has also gotten rid of tremors in some Parkinson's patients. So our next question coming up is from, excuse me, from... Um, Shard, Shardha, sorry if I said your name in, incorrectly. Um, Shardha says, what do you recommend for a vegan with tonsillitis and tonsil stone problems? Wow. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. When you say tonsillitis, I think of... If you simply tone to your tonsils, maybe go up and down a little bit in frequency until you find a frequency that feels right on them, it will overcome that and stabilize it. So like this. It's almost the exact same thing you would do for the thyroid, right? Play with different tonalities, different vowels to see what feels right. And just touch, trust your intuition of what feels right. Again, even if you don't get it right, you're still doing consistent, stable vibrations. If you get the frequency right, you get the tone right, now you're entraining those tonsils into their natural vibration. And even if it does nothing, you'll feel better. And feeling better could actually heal it. <laughs> right? So that's, that's my first thought without getting very specific medically. I mean, down the road, you know, I mean, this is where we're headed is they do a little scan with a device that hopefully won't hurt you, right? And they find, oh, this is exactly the frequency you need for those tonsils. Just play this, put the headphones. We got a device that you can hold on your body. We have belts that you can strap on the body, or you can actually just play headphones, put the headphones. That's another thing you could try is um, try different music that's really healing. I mean, in the classes, we'll talk about frequencies. We actually have frequencies that, or uh 
oh, oh, I've got frequencies for nerves, tendons, ligaments on my side, but you can actually put those headphones with the music or those frequencies right on your neck and just leave it there and notice if it feels comfortable or not, right? And normally it will. And so that's that's a really good good idea. I don't I don't see how vegan is, uh, being a vegan uh, ties into it though. But uh, just yeah, <laughs> that's it. Thank you very much. And our final question is from Francis, who says, thank you, David, for sharing your experience with us. I feel grateful that my question will be received in a good way. I have experienced many openings through sound by both passively receiving and through the active participation participation of vocalization. Will you please describe the ways you invite others to use imagination and personal imagery to aid in their auditory and verbal experiences? Oh boy, we're gonna do it in a lot of different ways. We're gonna do it uh, physically, right, on the body for, for different issues on the body. We're gonna do a whole range of sounds that'll invite people to make to make the sound of stuck emotions to make the sound of the part of the body that's holding those emotions, to make the sound of, of source coming through you to release the stuck emotions, even higher, right? And again, I always start with the rule. You can't make a wrong or bad sound. Then we'll actually make the sound like we started out in the beginning of love, right? We'll tune into that. We'll be making the sound of gratitude in detail. We'll be practicing the sound of, of, uh, of of compassion and and also especially of joy. We're going to be making the sound of all of these. And really, here's the deal. So again, it's like whatever people feel comfortable doing, they'll be able to do. Of course, you know, I mean, they're not here at, at the school, so I can't like look over people and say, no, don't don't. You know, I can't coach people as much, but. Really, to, to just invite people, and I'll talk in the beginning about getting over any, uh, oh, we'll start at the beginning of each class by making the sound of how you're feeling. You know, so you start to get comfortable. We'll be doing sound a lot. So it becomes more natural for you. By the end of the course, you'll totally, you'll totally feel comfortable. Um, so the, the deal is really when you make sound, and accompany it with an intention or an emotion at the same time, you're creating a stronger resonant field. And the stronger, there's a basic law of physics. A strong resonant vibration will overcome a weaker and then train the weaker into the stronger. When you have both a sound and an emotion and an intention together, it creates a very strong vibration that will overcome practically anything, let me say, not practically, anything in your system, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. But here's the best part. It creates a stronger resonant vibration that goes out to the world. And when we get enough people creating these strong, stable, consistent vibrations, on the planet, the rest of the people will be entrained into this. Just like when you're at a festival or a big event, everybody gets entrained into the same vibration. Imagine this happening on the planet. This is the whole deal. So everywhere you go, people are going, And you can't go out of the field. That's the deal. So the other part to throw in is play. Let's play. You can't do it wrong. Play. And then go deeper. Thank you.
Thank you. This has been a wonderful hour with you. Thank you to all of you for being with us today and for your questions. Sound Healing Immersion begins Wednesday, December 4th. Again, please visit soundhealingimmersion.com to learn more and to register. And if you do so by midnight, November 21st, you will receive this special audio bonus called Unconditional Love. David, do you have any final words for our listeners? Uh, one thing, someone had mentioned, uh, do these classes count toward our whole certificate and associate degree here at the school? And they do, because they're, they're somewhat similar. So you can uh, definitely uh, use those. And, you know, it's really, there's two things we're doing here, uh, we're, or three things. One is we're, we're learning to understand how it works so we can bring it into the mainstream. And because when you know how things work, it you believe it more and the people you're working on believe it more. And belief is 90% of the healing, right? That's the first thing. The second is we're just going to, to get high. We're going to do a lot of things where you will be, people will be blissed out still and blissed out and connected to source, full range. And then the other is very real, easy, specific techniques to actually help heal yourself and others. And get really high and still. I love it. I'm with it. I support it. Everyone, come and join us. Thank you for joining us on this call. We look forward to seeing you in the course. On behalf of all of us at the Shift Network, I wish you well. And I will see you on this call and on more in the future. Bye-bye.